excellent. Uh, so, Kamikaze, are you guys having fun today? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's your favorite thing you've seen so far? Yeah. Nobility. I heard nobility. Nobility is going to be the correct answer for the rest of the day. <laughs> All right, so uh, I have the cast and crew outside, and I'm going to bring him in right now. Uh, so, first off, let's bring out the director, Neil Johnson. He was a uh, director of over 11 sci-fi films and 500 plus music videos. And uh, he told me to tell you that he's a spoiled brat too. So, Neil, if you want to come on up. Uh, uh, next we have Tori Higginson from Stargate Atlantis. Uh, Tech War with William Shatner, and you can't miss this one, Stonehenge Apocalypse, and lots of non-sci-fi stuff. Tori. Stonehenge Apocalypse. Stonehenge Apocalypse. <laughs> Next we have Darren Jacobs. Darren, I, I just have Starship Rising. So Darren Jacobs from Starship Rising and <laughs> Nobility. Uh, up next we have A Miracle Lori. You will know her from uh, Joss Whedon's Dollhouse, uh, movies like Any Day Now with Alan Cumming, and Scenic Group with Josh Duhamel. <laughs> and then we have Ellen Dubin. Ellen Dubin, the Gemini nominated uh, actress from The Collector, Lex, Skyrim, and of course, Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> And of course we have to announce James Kyson, known for Ando from Heroes, and uh... What's up? <laughs> the only one committed to Kamikaze. I'm gonna say it's uh, Snow Brothers? Snow Brothers? Is that it? Oh no, it's a unicorn. Oh guys. I'm a Jedi unicorn. <laughs> I just need a, a license. <laughs> And of course we have our writer and producer and actor and all around wonderful man, E.J. De La Pena. Great. So before we get started and, uh, with the questions, uh, we have a special video. Uh, we do have one more person coming in, but uh, You'll see him. You'll, you'll know when you see him. Uh, he's parking right now. So uh, why don't we get started with a, a special intro video for us. Technical difficulty. I love technical difficulties, don't you? Can we get the lights mm -hmm. off up here as well? Have you considered the possibility of Open yourselves up to receive the message that each of you is trying to convey, as opposed to constantly arguing about Thanks. who's right. What's more important? Who's right? Being right? Or being together? <laughs> Well, the wonderful Doug Jones. Uh, counseling, some stuff in this. So right off the bat, let's talk about what is nobility about? You think I know? Oh. <laughs> um, um, we're we just going to whisper up here for the entire panel. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. You know. <laughs> no, um, I think the best way to describe nobility, I mean, obviously you've all heard the, the, uh, 
description Firefly meets the office. I'm seeing a lot of Firefly t-shirts and whatnot out there, which is awesome. Um, but it really goes deeper than that. While we do have a, a really strong comedic aspect, as you can obviously see, um, it really is about these wacky characters having a reason for being the way they are and watching them overcome these tra the, the tragic circumstances that drive them to these wacky behaviors in order for them to um, rise to the challenges that are put before them during the course of the show. Uh, ultimately, these are real people existing in a real world with consequences for their actions. Uh, but that doesn't mean we can't have a lot of fun on the way. <laughs> um, one thing I would like to do is, I mean, that's, that was my intent while, when I was creating it, when I was writing it, but I'd love to hear um, what a lot of the cast say, have to say about that, as well as uh, Neil, our director. Uh, you know, in reading the script and, and performing their, their roles, I'd love to hear what, what their interpretation was. If I may. Starting with me. <laughs> um, my, my feeling about nobility and what it is, is uh, I'm a big lover of uh, shows like Red Dwarf and um, you know, Doctor Who and stuff like that. And it's kind of got that same sort of humor, that same sort of fun. Uh, but the other side of, you look at all these shows, it's still got a real science fiction edge to it. You know, there's real situations, real characters having real problems, and it just happens to be fun, as um, life often is. So for me, nobility is funny, but is also a really great story and a great characters, you know, interacting with each other, which is what I really love. It's not, it's not slapstick, which, uh, you know, makes it, I think, will make it much more long-term long type thing. You know, like Star Trek was funny sometimes, and it's kind of in that same vein, you know, it's kind of carrying that, that humor aspect, I guess, through the whole thing. What he said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think what I, I attracted me to the script was that, I, to me, what I like about comedy is when it is based in something real. And so these characters are sort of tragic, and what makes the, it, so the humor comes out of something real. It comes out of their sort of the scars that made them tragic, and it comes out of the situation they find themselves in. So there is, I felt when I read it that there was a strong dramatic line and science fiction line, and then there is wonderful sort of playfulness around that and seeing people that kind of can't cope somehow coping, and um, that's what appealed to me about the show. Yeah, similar to Tori. Um, she was just saying that I think that um, a lot of drama and a lot of um, uh, comedy comes from having uh, great characters put in situations. So um, it's, it was how all these defined characters that are not perfect uh, in this situation where they've got the most powerful starship in, in uh, the galaxy and they really should be in control, but they are. And I think that's a great situation. But, but, um, that we built on, and I really was attracted to that. And, that was, and I got a great character, so yeah. <laughs> that was another thing as well. <laughs> we actually are joined with by Charles. Uh, he's the composer of the building as well. Yeah. So, so that awesome music you heard during the uh, uh, confessional we just showed. All him, guys. All him. Um, for me, honestly, uh, Adrian Wilkinson is a good buddy of mine, and she's in the cast. She's not here today, unfortunately, but uh, she's the one that invited me to come play. And to me, uh, the whole cast was pretty much established when I got asked to come on board, and that was honestly one of the most appealing things to me. There must be something really special going on if you have all these beautiful people on stage with me, plus everyone that's not here, like Doug and Cass and Chris and Adrian and um, Walter. Walter, hello, Chekhov, my God, is that impressive? <laughs> um, so to me, that was the most appealing, the fact that it's, you know, good characters, a good script, and a good story, and just a lot of fun. And I think everyone really likes each other, and that helps, and we just have a good time doing it. I'm very, very pleased to be a part of it. What she said. <laughs> um, a great chemistry, great cast, and um, I'm grateful to Kaz Anvar for bringing me on board, and I went to a reading, and uh, <coughs> what I did and I happened to uh, um, really connect with this interesting unique character that the three of us and Adrian Wilkinson were all part of a different race of people that's all I can tell you we're very um, intelligent very um, 
We like to help humans along the way and teach them things. That's all I can really say and keep it um, on the on the quiet. But uh, the what DL. You, the DL, the down low, the down low. But the cast <laughs> attracted me. I've been a huge fan of his for a long time. And when someone says Walter Koenig and Doug Jones, all of you would run and do it as well. And um, I love the script. I love the uh, conflict, and there's a lot of dramatic stuff in it, as well as the comedy. And as an actor, all of us love to sort of teeter that edge between comedy and drama. I'm going to pass you to the beautiful Jay. Jay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Uh, yeah, well, I love the title, first of all, because uh, I had the word nobility written uh, on my wall. If you, uh, in my place, I have writings all over my wall, and um, that was just one of the things I had up. This was way before I even met EJ, so I thought that was weird. Um, and uh, I actually met Cass uh, on a game night, like a board game night. He's my next door neighbor, and then we just got talking, and then he introduced me to EJ. And uh, it was just really EJ's energy. You know, when we had the meeting, I just loved his enthusiasm, and. And then of course the story was great, and, and so, um, yeah, I really hope we do have a Halloween episode, though. <laughs> <laughs> I could put this costume to use. <laughs> Done. <laughs> oh boy. Well, I already uh, gave my answer. Um, so Charles, anything you wanted to? Well, uh, yeah, I, I met EJ uh, at the American Film Market, uh, and. Um, Basically, very quickly, we, we connected with each other because we're both really big, giant sci-fi fans, and you know, the whole uh, eternal discussion, also you brought the Star Wars or Star Trek. And coming from France, truth is, Star Trek was never really like, it was kind of hard to, to watch Star Trek in France. Like, it's, it's not, it, I mean, for whatever reason, France is the one European country where watching sci-fi is actually kind of hard. Uh, they don't obviously put it at the right times, and you know, when Next Generation was on air, I was very little, so there's no way my mom would leave me you know, watch the thing at 11 p.m. So, uh, after meeting EJ, I actually had to do a lot of catch up and Netflix helped a lot. <laughs> and so, uh, I'm very proud to say I just finished The Next Generation, Voyager, <laughs> Deep Space Nine. <laughs> one, of, one of the really um, uh, funny things about this project is, uh, as Charles Henry was saying, I'm a ridiculous Trekkie. Um, but <laughs> get some thumbs up over here, awesome. Um, but but Neil is a diehard Star Wars fan, so we're we're kind of you know you know got some rivalries going on. But it also goes to show you you got a little bit of everything in the show, and it'll appeal to uh, it has shown appeal to a lot of different folks, uh, especially because we're cast. So yeah, speaking of, I mean, this is a veritable powerhouse of sci-fi actors, and so I just want to know like what is it about the sci-fi genre that attracts you to it and keeps you coming back to, to doing sci-fi as a genre. Me, me personally? Yeah, or? everyone. Like, everyone. Like, to, like what, what about the sci-fi genre led you to create something like Nobility? Right? I mean, for me, what I've always, ever since I was a little kid, been fascinated with is the ability for sci-fi to not just take you to another world, but then to allow you to turn around and look back at what we're doing in our own lives, and then learn something from that <coughs> storytelling. Um, plus, a lot of really cool VFX doesn't hurt. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so yeah, if anyone else has a... Sci-fi is really interesting because um, it's one of the few platforms on television where you can question um, social aspects and economic aspects, because uh, it's in a made-up universe or a made-up situation. So um, I think it's really good because it's very current, even though it's in a fant fantastical world. And um, especially like Star Trek was one of the things that would um, question those um, aspects that's going on currently at the moment. Because like your procedural dramas on TV, they don't really do that. And if they do, like um, David, um, oh God, what's his name? Uh, who does all like Picky Fantasies and did, uh, uh, yeah, David Kelly, David e. Kelly, they kind of cut him off as soon as it starts getting into the swing of it. But with, with sci-fi, you can, you can go down that road and you, you can question, and it's kind of allowed. And I, I think that's great for this current climate and situation. And that's why I like sci-fi as well. But I'm a huge sci-fi fan as well. <laughs> I feel like it represents possibility. Um, you know, it's sort of like our future projected. 
you know, onto the present. And um, <laughs> my fiance told me the story. Someone was uh, channeling, you know, like uh, those those people who like channel aliens or whatever. And uh, they asked the alien, like, "Hey, what what is the most, what is the closest thing to like an ideal future?" And I think the alien was like, "The closest thing that you guys have to like an ideal future is science fiction." And I thought, "Ah, that's kind of, yeah, because it's like, uh, it just really, it's like the best of our imagination, like projected onto the present." <laughs> <laughs> Which we are going to do in this panel. We're going to tell some aliens. But you also, I hate to follow that because it's so beautifully put, there are so many genres within this genre. I mean, there's sci fi shows where you can be, you know, a, a villain and over the top, and then there's sci fi shows where you can be a villain and not over the top. And I think it also, what I really like about sci fi, again, is the possibilities, but also the fact that. It questions relationships, love, power, conflict, um, all the stuff that goes back to us being human beings. And even though it can be in a far out world or a crazy world or you know special effects, it all comes down to me about human behavior and relationships. And those are the shows in the sci-fi world that appeal to me. And as a woman, I have to tell you that the parts uh, are more generally multi-layered, and I hate to use this word, the word strong woman, but they they allow for more ballsy, more intricate, more layered kind of writing for women. For some reason, the writers in sci-fi give us characters, and it's getting better in, in, in network television, but the characters for women seem to be a lot more layered, so I really, as a woman, love that. <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, sci-fi is the reason I, I'm even here. I mean, if it wouldn't be for sci-fi, I'd probably have just like a, a little job in France and having a terrible <laughs> life. Uh, sci-fi... Uh, okay. I, 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 Suggests that there's some sort of intelligence in the actors, yes. <laughs> which, <laughs> which, um, but seriously, it's uh, you know, I, I, uh, when starting in it, I, you know, like like we all do, we look for jobs, and so I, I did some guest spots on like procedurals and stuff like that, and it's, it's boring. Like I don't, I don't enjoy even the process of, of making that kind of stuff. I really enjoy making uh, sci-fi. I mean, it's just surely just what interests me as a person. So I, I think that's kind of the long and short of it. Well, I'd like to ask uh, everyone in the cast, like, could you uh, talk a little bit about each of your characters? Describe everyone. Why don't we start with Tori? <laughs> oh, um, so I'm still second in the question. Um, the character, I play a woman called Commander Pikeman, who is, um, yeah, she's strong. She knows what she wants. She knows what she doesn't like. She um, isn't afraid of, of expressing what she doesn't like. Um, probably not so open to express what she does like. Um, so she's, yeah, she's got a lot going on. She sort of sits on it, but um, she gets the job done. I like her. Um, I play Lieutenant, Lieutenant uh, Sirius Salute. I am Eugene. Um, 
there's some things that I can't say, but I will say this. Um, so in 400 years, parts of humanity split off to, it's like the pilgrims decide to um, go their own way to better themselves um, by using eugenics and selective breeding. And uh, in 700 years, we come back to humanity, to Earth, and I'm one of those people. And I join um, this crew of the nobility as a you know, liaison officer who is very strict and very formal and military aware. And I come on this ship with all these people who have no idea about anything. So <laughs> I, from, I his perspective. <laughs> from his perspective, from my perspective. <laughs> yeah, so that's my character. I play his sister back at home base, basically, and uh, there's a lot to be uh, determined and revealed about my character, and I think that's all I can say. And I'm also part of the same race, the Eugen, E-U-J-I-N? Yes. yes, and I play Colonel Taya, and I come on board Captain Cern, played by Kaz Anwar's ship, to observe. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I play Lieutenant Bobby Takashima. He's the uh, pilot of Nobility, uh, so I'm the navigator. And I also have a, uh, an old airplane called a Betty that I like to fly around. I guess it used to be a cargo ship. Right? Renovated into a, uh, a cool, I don't know what you want, whatever you want to call it. But it's, it's my little pet. And uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's very cowboy. Western inspired, so he loves all things cowboy, boots, country music, uh, hats, uh, rodeos, y'all name it, he likes it. Um, yeah. Uh, I play uh, Admiral Nev, who uh, I get. <laughs> it's the kid watching my car, so he got towed. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, he is as untilk like as possible. Uh, he he's uh, he speaks. <laughs> he's uh, he's conflicted, uh, and uh, I don't know if the, he has a. Uh, can I say what sort of what his relationship is with with uh, with Captain? Um. Kind of. Yeah, a, a little bit. I wouldn't say exactly what it is, but I will go ahead and s talk about uh, how he, there was a falling out on the hooks. And he, uh, okay, yeah. So there has been a uh, falling out between he and the captain. Apparently, I can't get too specific. <laughs> Watch and see. <laughs> and, um, and I'm still lobbying for him to be a cross-dresser. <laughs> you would look great in a moo-moo. <laughs> and, and musically, the interesting thing for me is all these characters, as you heard, have like all their different backgrounds and personalities. The challenge with nobility is to blend that all together and make it, have it make it sense musically. So the main frame of the music is orchestral, which is another reason why I love this project. But like you heard, like Takashima loves country music, and so all of, all of his themes have like country music elements. He's gonna have banjo, he's gonna have you know some like guitars and stuff, harmonica, and and yet when you know action comes in and stuff, the orchestra kicks in, but then all of a sudden you can start to hear still that banjo playing in the background because it's Takashima, and you know same thing like uh, Walter Koenig, who's going here today, uh, plays also the, the engineer, and he. You know, Mooney is very Irish, and so he has like some sort of like Irish theme. And because he's also the engineer, I'm using some sort of like metal. I, I've been using like you know uh, uh, mechanical tools to make percussions with it, and I kind of blend all that together. So you know, all these characters like they they're witty. They they have definitely you know he wants to be a crossdresser right there. You know. uh, no, my character. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is inspired by. <laughs> but it's okay if you do. Yeah. So, so next time you're gonna show up in a bikini, right? I've got one on now. <laughs> well, and let me just say, finding a Frenchman who knows what to do with a banjo, oh. gold. Yeah. <laughs> 
most American Frenchmen read the meat. So you're going to give us a yeehaw? Yeehaw! <laughs> <laughs> I give credit to James for that because he does it a lot in the show and I'm learning from him right there. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. <laughs> Well, I, I went ahead and gave myself a small role. I play the uh, ship's medical doctor. Um, and he's this very, uh, he's one of those people who doesn't have a lot of real world experience. It's all book knowledge. And so that leads to some very uh, interesting interactions between him and his patients who don't quite trust that he knows what he's doing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. Awesome. Well, I'd like to open up uh, questions to the audience. Uh, there's a microphone in the middle of the aisle here. If anyone has any questions for the cast and crew of Nobility, anyone? Ask anything. Don't be shy. Anything. Come on. We already talked about bikinis. And, you it's know. true. <laughs> What'd you guys dress up as last night? That's what I want to know. Um, well, I was here last year, and what you kind of last year? I was. It, obviously, it's grown. Um, how much more do you expect it to grow? Have you guys been picked up by anybody? Is it still your own independent thing? How's that going? Um, well, what I can say, it is still our own independent thing, but there is uh, a lot of interest. I can't go into too many specifics, but there's a lot of interest from a lot of different people, and we're currently working through and figuring out where the best offers are going to be and the best uh, deals uh, will be, and also, um, yeah, continuing to see, you know, it, it's almost like every couple of weeks we hear somebody else is interested. Um, or we're able to get a meeting with someone else. And so it's, it's growing very rapidly, uh, and right now it seems like the sky's the limit. Oh, okay. um, and one thing, and, but no matter what happens, one thing we've always guaranteed is that one way or another, this is getting out to audiences, people are going to see this, um, and yeah, so that's where we're at. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. I just want to say, Neil, it's good to see you've done well since we threw you out of Australia. <laughs> I thought that was you. I thought that can't be Peter. It's Bart. me. <laughs> oh, I'll see you later. Wow. Holy shit. We used to, okay. Yeah, we talk. We used, you used to run all the Star Trek conventions That's in right. Australia. And I used to go, didn't I? Neil uh, used to come to all our Star Trek conventions. From the age of 13. And, and I have the photos to show the car. No, uh, <laughs> no there's no car. I'll talk to you later. Nice yeah. to see you, Peter. <laughs> that wasn't a question. <laughs> Okay, I promise this actually is a question. <laughs> so you guys mentioned Firefly and Office, and that is very similar, but what are your biggest inspirations, this is more directly towards you, um, EJ, what is the biggest inspiration rooted for Nobility in? Um, there wasn't just one. Um, you know, I grew up so incredibly obsessed with sci-fi um, that to say that anyone was, was an influence, I uh, wouldn't be accurate. What I, more what I did as far as my influences is I, kind of picked and chose what I liked about different shows. Like I loved Battlestar Galactica's character drama, but I loved the story arc of Babylon 5. I loved the, the humor of like Doctor Who and Stargate. I loved the, or the quirkiness. I loved the um, altruism of Star Trek. And I kind of, and I loved the adventure of Star Wars. And so I just kind of took all of that and kept that in mind. Uh, oh, and I love the, um, the, the one-liners of Firefly and uh, uh, Dr. Who, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Horrible sing-along blog. You know, that kind of, you know, that kind of beat where it's like, you know, boom, wait, did he just say that? Or did that just really happen? Um, and so I just kind of took all of that and while I was writing, kept that in mind. And when it came from what I was writing the series Bible and designing the story arc, I was thinking more, you know, Babylon 5 or, or DS9. Uh, and then when I was deciding what the show was about, um, I really was, you know, was keeping in mind more of Star Trek and, and having it mean something and not just be a uh, spectacle uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's kind of how it came about. That sounds really cool. It's absolutely awesome. Um, <laughs> so if you could see if you had a quick floor person, do you mind if I get back in line and ask another question after? Uh, uh, if you, I'm sorry, what was that? Since there's one person, do you mind if I get back in line and ask another question after? Uh, it doesn't bother me. No. Ask him now. I'm too short for this. <laughs> rock star now. Just rock star. There we go. That's a problem solver. Okay, uh, I'm just wondering, hi, good morning, guys. Uh, is, the, 
is there any way that fans of sci-fi can help you out? Like, are you guys running a Kickstarter, or do you have any other projects that we should be supporting for you guys personally? Oh, wow. <laughs> Great question. I wish I could ask that. Yeah, it's, it's really funny because uh, in the run-up to this convention, we were a little short-handed, and uh, we put out on our Facebook that we needed help, and we, and we actually got a, a good number of responses. So honestly, like us on Facebook, follow our Twitter, and also, uh, if you go to our website, you'll see, uh, go to the contact us. Go ahead and send an email, let us know what you might be interested in helping out with. And yeah, a lot of the folks who are uh, helping us out on a, a daily or weekly basis are volunteers like yourself. So feel free to contact us and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, see you know, if there's a way we can, we, you can help out. Okay, does anybody else have any other projects going on? Like, anybody got any books or? You? <laughs> I, I would love it if you would go to Walmart or iTunes and buy my latest film, Starship Rising. That would make me very happy. Um, right and if, if right you write now. a nice review, that would make me extremely happy. <laughs> but it's Starship Rising is out now, and Starship Apocalypse will be out next year. And EJ's in that movie as well, and so is Darren. So, and Charles did the music. So yeah, there's a CD soundtrack. We're all in the same family. So. Yeah, thanks, guys. So uh, what, one thing I do want to share is um, I'm doing this thing called Hashtag Good 30. It's a thing that my friend Justin Baldoni started. He's on a show called Jenny the Virgin. And um, so you basically do one good act or one good deed in 30 days, um, get it on a 30 second video, and then you just post it. So, um, so good, Hashtag Good 30, Good 30, G-O-O-D 30. So, uh, so I encourage everybody to do it. Um, so today, uh, you know, we're going to be doing some signings later, and uh, so for me, like all the so my good thirty that we're going to take today is all the proceeds today is going to go to a, uh, a service project for like a charity cause. So, uh, but it could be anything small, just even uh, giving uh, food to a homeless person to helping out a neighbor. So, just want to encourage everybody to uh, participate. Hashtag good thirty. Yeah. And then. Uh, and uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of projects that I can talk about, but um, but uh, basically, when, uh, when you hashtag it later on, it's going to be all collated into a, uh, the, the biggest collated viral video uh, in the world, basically. So all the good acts will kind of like be in this one video from the community. Um, I have, um, um, I'm doing a new project next week in Reno, Nevada, a new sci-fi show called Starfall, but I don't want to promote another show while I'm here. But um, I'm doing um, continuing work, which I'm allowed to talk about on Elder Scrolls Online in video game. And I just came out with a huge uh, trailer for a game called uh, Scream, what is it? It's Scream Ride. It's a behemoth trailer for Scream Ride, and I just finished um, Defense Grid 2. Uh, which is a, another video game, um, and a couple of films. So it's, it's very busy. But in terms of nobility, I think also you could, you know, say you came to the panel today, and what a fun group of people on your <laughs> Facebook or on Twitter. And just start, you know, it's sort of like you tell one friend, and then they tell another, and because uh, we're very proud of this project. And it's, it's guys like you that will help, you know, sell it and get it out there. So thank you very much for that question. Much appreciated. One thing I'm I would... Uh, I'm sorry, go for it. Go for it. Okay, sorry. Um, my husband, Christopher May, who's also an actor, fantastic. Uh, he's here. Hi, what's up, honey? Um, <laughs> <laughs> he and I actually both play ukulele and sing, and we have a ukulele cover band called Ukebox Heroes. Um, so you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. We're kind of adorable. And we do everything from like 50s to today, Hawaiian, rock, uh, just anything that makes us happy, and he writes some originals, and we just have a lot of fun. So, Youth Box Heroes, and that's it. <laughs> One thing I, I do really want to go ahead and say is that we wouldn't be here without you guys. Uh, you know, we, many of us up here are, aren't just professionals in the industry, but we're also uh, enjoy the genre, or we're huge fans of the genre, and I know when I was sitting down creating this, I wanted to create something that was, uh, in a sense, by fans, for fans. Uh, and because you guys have been you know, coming to our panels, coming to our, our, our booths, you know, liking us on Facebook, liking us on Twitter, uh, and showing people that, yes, this is something that the fans want, 
it's been a huge help in us going and uh, trying to get picked up and things like that. So thank you guys for supporting us. And you know, the best way you can help is just continue to support us and spread the word. Share our posts on Facebook and, and retweet our tweets and uh, all that fun stuff. So I think uh, Chris had something to say. Since we're not promoting our other projects, um, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have uh, heard of. Uh, I don't think this is what the competition. Uh, uh, a game called Infinity Blade. Uh, it's the largest um, iOS game ever. It had 15 million buys. Um, we're doing uh, a live-action Infinity Blade, and uh, I'm playing Thane and also one of the producers. Um, and it's only available, it will only be available um, through the Infinity Blade store. So um, that's where it'll come out first. Um, so please keep an eye out for it. And uh, there you have it. Thank you for letting me not promote that. <laughs> hey guys, it's not a problem, I don't mind. <laughs> so what was your first experience in the sci-fi like a term, universe. This is a question for each of you guys. First experience in the sci-fi universe. Well, I know for me, the first movie I ever remember seeing was Star Trek VI. So <laughs> that was my first exposure to sci-fi, I guess. Tari's got a good answer. <laughs> um, I actually, my first job was uh, a series called Tech War that was written and directed and produced by William Shatner, and he was in it as well. And I had just come out of theater school in England where I was studying Shakespeare, darling. So I thought it was terribly, terribly, I just wasn't interested in sci-fi at all. I look back and I go, what an asshole I was. <laughs> it was a remarkable experience with some of the most amazing people in sci-fi, and I was all like, I'm all Shakespeare. I don't have time for this. And through the years, I've done enough sci-fi now that I have learned to understand it and I appreciate it and love it in a way that I never would have thought that I did. And I truly believe that if Shakespeare was writing today, he'd be writing sci-fi. I think absolutely he would. Because he would be the most genre that was going to give him the most freedom to express as many ideas and be as cheeky as he could religiously and politically and culturally and that's what this genre does. So. That was my first experience, and I had no idea how lucky I was at the time. And I look back at it now, and I go, yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, mine is a polarization of her story. I <clears throat> did lots of theater, and I was doing Shakespeare in England. And I did my first sci-fi film, which was for Neil, um, called Death Machine. And like, I was on Facebook going, oh my god, I'm doing this sci-fi movie, yeah! <laughs> After doing all the Shakespeare and everything, and everyone was like, what? I mean, it, for me, it was just a dream come true. <laughs> so, you know, because I've always wanted to do that uh, cartoon, computer games, and sci fi stuff. I've always wanted to do it, so this was pretty amazing for me to do that. Um, for, for me, uh, I, was, I was the age of two, I saw Neil Armstrong walking on the moon, and it just bamboozled me, and to this day, I've been into sci fi since that moment. I just wanted to jump in quickly and say what I loved about. Um, one thing I learned about sci-fi, which at first as an actor, you're trained to react to what you're given. So you're told you react, you don't act. So I had a really hard time as an actor with sci-fi at first because there's so much green screen and so much stuff that you're like, I don't know what I'm reacting to. And I used to find that very stifling as an actor. And again, it took me a while to understand, to go, wait a minute, there's way more freedom here. It's your imagination. And going back to this childlike thing, I've just, Blowing the boundaries of your imagination as wide as you can. And so sci-fi has taught me to be a better actor in a lot of ways, too. Uh, so my first experience with sci-fi has nothing to do with me as an actor. I was 10 years old, and my dad is a huge uh, Trekkie. And we went to Universal Studios, and they used to have this interactive thing where you could go, and they would choose you from the audience. I don't even know how they made this happen. My parents are magic like this. And my dad got chosen. And they do like a whole bit. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so this was like 20 years ago. So, um, so they would like take you backstage and they do a whole stage show. I was like, where the hell did my dad go? What did they do with him? And then at one point, they incorporate it into the scene, and these four people from the audience come on stage, and my dad is like in full-on Klingon gear. <laughs> it's amazing. He was on the bridge. I was like, what is happening? 
Um, so that was fantastic, and I think we got a picture, and he was pretty much in tears. He was so happy. So that was, that was my first time by experience. When, when I was five years old, I did the exact same thing, and I was like, there's this picture of me with uh, straddling this massive thing on five-year-old me with this foam rock going, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's in jail now, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was never... Let me finish with the phallic jokes there. I was um, never a sci-fi fan, originally, and I remember my agent at the time sent me an audition for this show called Lex. And it was a monologue. Uh, they only had one piece, and it was uh, the monologue of, if you ever watched the show, the male lead, sort of an everyman, Stanley Tweedle. They had the, the rep, yeah, you know. Anyway, so there was no script. And I got this monologue, and I went, I don't want to go to this audition. I do not like this material. It was talking about an island of women. It was a monologue about how he was fantasizing. Of, you remember that, yeah. So all of us had the same text, so I thought, Okay, I'm a woman and I'm gonna talk about an island of women. Okay, I know where I'm going with this one. And um, that was my first experience and I booked uh, the cannibal woman, Jigabo, Jig, I can't even remember her name, Jigarada the Wicked. And I became um, a huge fan favorite because people loved the fact that I ate men, women, and children and didn't just have any uh, was discrimination against anyone, I just ate everyone. And uh, the, the wonderful part was that uh, because of you guys, I ended up going back in four seasons and kept getting reincarnated as different characters, and I finally uh, ended up shooting uh, in Thailand, which was the most incredible experience of my life. Um, and I ended up playing Jigarada, the cannibal, I ended up being the Pope, so I'm the first <laughs> female Pope in sci-fi history. I think the only one so far. So Lex was my first experience in sci-fi. That's quite an achievement. Thank you. Was that a cannibal Pope then? Yeah. That's what I was just going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. First female cannibal. There, there, were, there were elements of uh, that kind of aggression, but no. That, Uh, when I was four or five, and this was when my family was still living in uh, South Korea before we moved to New York, uh, they were playing, like they played five American shows, and the three of them were uh, The Hulk, uh, <laughs> Knight Rider, and uh, V, like the original series V. And uh, I just remember being like enthralled by it and just kind of like, I mean, I thought there were like literally people who come down and that they had like, you know, that reptile skin. And I was like, that, that, that made me really afraid. But it was all dubbed in Korean. So I thought that like when we went to the stage and I met the Hulk, he was going to speak to me in Korean. <laughs> that, that, was like, that was my reality then. So, um, so yeah, and then my first experience working in sci-fi was Heroes. Uh, so it was kind of like my introduction, and then I remember the anime network wanted to do something where they wanted to send me to an anime convention and just kind of capture the experience, and that was my first time like at a con, and I was just like, I, I never, when I was growing up, I didn't know that these things existed. Like, I've never been to a con, so it just like blew my mind, and then when we did a panel at Comic Con for the first time, I, I was just like, yeah, it was like sensory overload, so, so it was a huge introduction for me. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I had kind of two experiences that uh, kind of, my mom worked at Bank of America for many years and uh, Sulu had an account at Bank of America. <laughs> <laughs> I did uh, yeah, or, yeah. He, had a, he had an account at uh, Bank of America and uh, so my mom would like watch Star Trek, to, just to see you know what, what George was doing, and to, to have anyone of any color on TV at that time was pretty remarkable. Um, and then I remember <clears throat> I was probably I don't know, 11 or 12 years old, and uh, I'd finally gotten the hottest girl in school to my house, and Star Trek was on. I kind of had a foursome with Shatner. <laughs> I mean, he was on the screen, but I was like right there on the couch. 
and there was this duality. Was that too much? <laughs> that, was, that was maybe too much into my psyche. Did you, did you say you were 11? <laughs> Wow, man. <laughs> so, unfortunately... I in the ghetto. There was nothing else to do. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we got the five minutes, and we, don we wanted to show you guys the uh, official nobility trailer. Oh, so we want... Oh, yes. Come back. Come yeah, come on. Back back you, you were waiting. Um, well, I was an angry bird last night for whoever asked that question. I um, asked, <laughs> um, also, like... The, what what kind of vein is the humor in? Like, you know, as we compare to the office, is it that kind of like dry, like, uh, like kind of referential humor, or is it like, it's not very slapstick, I guess, is what he said earlier, but. Uh, yeah, not slapstick at all. Um, one of the fun things uh, I had when writing the show is because it, it's this unique space as a, as a what, what I call it as a dramedy, uh, you know, if I want to go really humor and a little over the top, I, I, I can. If I want to go really dark and and uh, dramatic, I can. And we'll, we'll see both of that, not only in the show itself, but in the, in the trailer we're about to, to present. Um, prob I can, I've been told a lot of people have likened it to, to Firefly. That's why I started calling it Firefly Meets the Office. Uh, as far as the office is concerned, um, the, 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 the office element, the real office element, is uh, we kind of have a little bit of that mockumentary style and the confessionals where you sit down and they're, and they're talking to the camera, as you saw uh, earlier. Uh, and that's kind of where the, the office element comes in with that kind of, uh, and a little bit of the awkwardness as well at times. Um, but then, yeah, a lot of people have, have come and told me that um, the the humor is kind of like those those quick beats that you see, those. Joss Whedon bits where it's like, oh wait, did that just happen? Or those quick, quick comments, you know, that come, you know, that if you're, you know, maybe if you're not paying attention, you'll miss, but it's there, and and a lot of people seem to enjoy. Good segue question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna play the trailer right now for you. These people are serving aboard the flagship of the Confederate Alliance. Never seen anything like it. Obviously, the best stock humans have to offer. Booty, we are under attack! Put the whiskey down, you son of a bitch! my chief engineer. You get to see the captain again. What is the status of your new arrivals? The city is for me to go a few weapons. I usually only have that effect on the ladies. Behavioral modification. Ben's ass kicked. Airport captain. Nothing I can't handle. Billy, do you copy? This is Takashima. I need help. Why must you throw everything? Why can't you do exactly what those guys say, captain? Traitor. crew are going to be down at the booth uh, at 12.30. At 12.30, uh, the booth number is 17.02. 17.02. So thank you all for coming out and thank you to the wonderful cast of the booth.